The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. I am Emily Swallow, also known as the Armorer on The Mandalorian. And I'm just giving a little shout out to the Secrets of Star Wars podcast because this is the way. You're listening to the Secrets of Star Wars. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sense was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a dead. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember... The Force will be with you, always. Hi, I'm Andrew Hermes, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we talk about everything connected to that galaxy far, far away. From movies to books to TV shows and more, we're looking at the deeper themes and meanings found in Star Wars. Today, we'll be discussing the long-awaited series, Andor. We'll be discussing the first three episodes, since we... Uh, since they graciously gave us three episodes uh, in its first week. Um, and so we'll have plenty to talk about. And we'll be talking with uh, two of our newest panelists here on The Secrets of Star Wars. Uh, we have first Robert King. Welcome to, uh, welcome to the panel. Thanks. Good to be here. And uh, we got Brandon Manderson. What's up, Brandon? Oh, hey there. Hey, how's it going? Excited to be here. I'm excited as well. Uh, me and Brandon, we go way back. Uh, we, we've, uh, we've both, uh, he, he's a former colleague at Catholic Answers, uh, where I currently work, and we still do a lot of work together. We're both mm-hmm. filmmakers, so, uh, and we both live in San Diego, uh, and we're good friends now, so we, we get a chance to, uh, to hang out and work, work with each other. We play on the same softball team. Yep. It's the first we get to record each other talking about Star Wars now. Yeah, nah, yeah. This Instead is another thing that to the list. In the office. Yeah, yeah. Um, so is uh, yeah. Brandon is definitely a natural fit because that's basically all. Uh, you know, most of our conversations revolve around Star Wars and what we like and what we don't like and what we wish would happen. So, um, I think Brandon will fit right in. And Robert, this is our first time meeting each other and and uh, recording with each other on Secrets of Star Wars. So, uh, welcome again to the show. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so just briefly, guys, before we get into Andor, I know we have a lot to cover. Um, maybe just tell me a little bit about your uh, history with Star Wars um, and how you became big fans. Maybe what's the first Star Wars movie you watch? What got you into the fandom? Um, Brandon, we'll, we'll start with you. OK, so my first Star Wars movie I watched was episode one and uh, <laughs> I watched it as a as a kid. And then I remember my uh, my dad. Uh, coming home one day and bringing me a VHS box set, which I still have of uh, the original trilogy. And I was like, there's more. And I was like freaking out. And then uh, <laughs> from then on, I, um, I, you know, I, I fell in love with star Wars. I even went to a, uh, a press screening of the, um, of uh, the clone Wars uh, movie uh, here in San oh. Diego. And I, I, oh, I sorry about like, that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love the Clone Wars. I watched it. Uh, that's uh, probably some of my favorite Star Wars content, along with Rebels and um, and all of it. And I just think that it's it's such a fun universe. And I just yeah got tons of paraphernalia and all that kind of stuff. So it's fun. I love it. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Phantom Menace was wasn't the first Star Wars movie I watched, but it was the first one I saw in theaters. So it had a had a profound effect on me. Um, Robert, how about you? Oh, I guess I'm the old man here. I uh, <laughs> yeah, one of my earliest memories is seeing Star Wars when it was just Star Wars uh, in the theater seventy seven, and um, yeah, you would almost say it was my first faith and my first heartbreak and uh you know i never believed in santa but i always believed in the jedi and i was crushed when i discovered i would never be one so um yeah i i also love rebels um 
The Rebels is oh yeah up there among mm-hmm. my favorite Star Wars. I've uh, watched pretty much everything that's come out, but uh, yeah, the original trilogy and uh, Rebels those are those are kind of the heart of of what I love about Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Yes, we love Rebels on the show. I mean, we've we've covered it, and uh, yeah, the animated series are 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 really just as important as as the movies and the shows and and the the fandom i think uh relies heavily on those animated series and we're seeing it more and more be incorporated into the the live action series obviously in mandalorian and uh and and a little bit in book of boba fett um and there's plenty more that they have planned so yes definitely big fans of rebels and clone wars here um very good. So we'll just we'll just get started. Uh, we'll, we'll we got three episodes to cover in, in one podcast episode. Um, that won't usually be the case because uh, after this, uh, starting next week, we'll we'll get one episode a week. Um, so episode one, uh, we uh, immediately get reacquainted with uh, Cassie and Andor, who we met in Rogue One, uh, and. Uh, we see him walking down a a dreary causeway, uh, making his way into the leisure zone on Morlana One. Okay, he mm-hmm. enters a brothel. All right, so right away, <laughs> and they specifically, you know, uh, l- uh, later on, I think after the scene, uh, you know, one of the officers uh, specifically says that this place that they were in is a brothel. So that's probably the first time almost assuredly the first time that we've heard the word brothel uh, being used or a brothel being a setting for a Star Wars uh, show ever. Um, Usually Star Wars, even though it can have very mature themes, um, it can sometimes, you know, have, you know, and and, and, in action scenes, especially like uh, if you think of uh, Revenge of the Sith, where they've taken some liberties with their PG-13 rating, um, you know, but there's still not a lot of, we don't see a lot of, like, things in, that are suggestive in, in sexual nature. Maybe a little suggestive, but something that's just in your face and literal and using a word like brothel. Um, it's something I wanted to point yeah, out. not in the shows or movies. Yeah, never, right? So, yeah. yeah. We're entering a little new, new territory here, and and I think uh, it's probably intentional by the creators. It's like, okay, here we are. This is you're seeing a, a side of the galaxy that we've never seen before, um, and we're gonna get into these like rough and gritty, um, and sometimes you know very adult in nature type of settings. So, uh, just want to get your your thoughts on on that and and seeing Star Wars. Uh, you know, try out, try themselves, uh, try going into settings like these. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've played some of the star Wars games, um, Mm -hmm. especially the, the, uh, MO, the, um, old Republic. Mm -hmm. And they definitely have some, uh, brothel like settings in the games. Um, but yeah, in the shows and the movies, they they always try to keep it family friendly, um, or uh, yeah, in that direction anyway. That said, I mean, I've always loved that 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 Star Wars has, I guess, what I would call mature themes without touching on those mature subject matters. Um, I mean, mature is kind of a weird word for it because, you know, who are the people who are most interested in (laughs) sex and violence and that sort of thing? It's it's teenagers, right? It's adolescents, but we call it adult or mature. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I think that it has a uh, it definitely adds uh, it definitely adds that more, you know, we, we call it more adult and more mature. But I think it yeah, like Star Wars is just we we've known it like through like this kid uh friendly thing i think i saw somebody uh somewhere say that like 
Star Wars was originally George Lucas's attempt at, um, you know, making something more uh, like family friendly in the in the 70s because they were kind of pushing the pushing the boundaries. Um, so I. Uh, yeah, um, initially I was like, oh, this is this is a lot. This is this feels different um, at first. Just just this opening scene. I was like watching it. I was like. Is that what they? I think it is. Are they going to do some like kind of twist where it's that's not what it is? It's going to be somebody's garage and they're like selling something like I don't know. They're selling blue milk or something in there, but uh, no blue milk <laughs> in that place. It's uh, yep, that's not what it's there. That's not what that place is for. So um, I uh, I yeah, my initial thoughts were like, well, okay, okay, that's where the show's going. I heard the show was going to be different than other Star Wars stuff, so um, than other Star Wars shows, but. Uh, you're right. This is something that has been present in. This is something that has been present in other Star Wars materials. Um, uh, so it's a, uh, it's interesting to see in the the opening episode. Yeah, I, I didn't have a problem with it. You know, as far as like, 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 you, like we've mentioned, it's Star Wars is this is sort of its first time, uh, really being uh, up upfront about, uh a setting like a brothel um and uh instead of being you know suggestive or um you know allowing the audience just to read between the lines um and because you know it it establishes uh the this not not just the setting of the show but the the tone and um you know it did it, the fact that it's a brothel does is not really the the point it's it could have been mm. you know any sort any sort of thing that that would uh convey that this is a more we're we're seeing the seedy side this mm -hmm. more like it, it's kind of like it's not as uh i again lack for lack of a better word mature as like blade runner mm -hmm. but it kind of mm -hmm. has a blade runner feel like even the yeah. cinematography especially in that first scene when he's running in the rain and yep. uh and his, and and the the night that scenes that was beautiful yeah, yeah it's, it's exactly it's a stunning show like just just from a aesthetic point of view and mm -hmm. um yeah i, th I think it was sure good that they stopped right choice, away though i don't think it's arbitrary like, either yeah I, I i think it's intentional yeah mm -hmm. because he's going there to look for his sister right mm -hmm. and yeah. it's it's kind of a cliche but you know he's He's searching for his sister in the place where she has fallen the lowest or, or mm -hmm. he suspects that she has. And, um, it's, I don't know. It's kind of a, I'm not sure if it's a, a point of connection between the galaxy far, far away and our own, or if it's lazy writing, I'm not sure, but it's, you know, in our own world, this is what happens to, especially to young women who are, um, you know, disadvantaged in a lot of ways. They can get easily sucked into the sex work industry and taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And now it's happening in Star Wars. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point. Um, yeah, it's again, it it serves the story. It serves the plot. So uh when whenever any anything i'm watching if it can do that and not just have things that are just ar arbitrary or adult in nature just for the sake of you know being risque or you know trying to push boundaries then then i think it's it's a good thing you know as long as it serves a story um so let's get back on track so he's um uh, he's at this uh He's at this bar um, and that's in this brothel and he's uh, he's approached by a female hostess um, and then two security inspection team guards uh, that we meet, Verlo Skiff and Kravas Drezer. The names in the show, I mean, very <laughs> Star Wars. So they're, Boy, they're I'm glad you've got those names. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Trust me, uh, <laughs> I had to, I had to, I had to get all this information down. Uh, this is not from memory. Uh, they take umbrage at the sight of Andor being served first, despite their longer wait. So the hostess tells them to behave 
but the older of the two guards, Drezzer, he wants to, he's picking a fight with Andor. Um, so like you mentioned, Endor, he's there. He's asking about his sister. He's asking about a woman from Canari. Um, but uh, the only woman by that description uh, left several months ago, according to this hostess. Um, when he's, when he persists and, and the hostess uh, asks, like, who is this woman to you? And uh, he explains that he's, that's when he reveals it's his sister. Um, and that's when the hostess gets serious and says that, she disappeared and, and advises him to do the same. Uh, so when she asks uh, her name, uh, when he asks uh, about, about his sister's name uh, to the hostess, she says that nobody gives their real name around here. Um, so he leaves, he walks to the street, and then those two guards, those two angry guards uh, come in, uh, and they, uh, they ask for his ID. He's ignoring them. Then Drezzer raises his blaster and raises his hands. The guard, uh, you know, he quips about abusing their power and then uh, and or he lets the guard search him. Uh, but then he fights back and then, you know, during the scuffle, he he shoots one of the guards and and he and kills him. Uh, it wasn't his intention, but he kills him. And uh, uh, the other guard realizing this is like begging and pleading with Andor, like, you know, uh, you know, don't kill me. Uh, uh, you know, we'll cover this up. This was an accident. And uh, despite his pleas, uh, Andor shoots him point blank right in the head. Um, so, yeah, that's a lot to take in in that first scene. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, Robert, what did you think? I mean, I was our introduction to Andor in Rogue One was also of him shooting somebody basically without provocation and so we kind of get that same introduction here and it's um in this case it's interesting that the guy is just cowering before him and he's clearly trying to figure out how to survive this situation and and or we realize we don't know at that point, but we know that he is not willing to get caught by the uh, by anyone associated with the Empire. So. So, yeah, we see him. Firing to protect himself in that sense, and and yet I don't know, it's Andor has always been a, a Han Solo type of character. He starts by being. Uh, someone who is who is always looking out for himself, but then he learns to help others. So this is this is a really good start to an anti-hero story. And Brandon? Yeah, I I I, I absolutely agree. I think that um uh seeing this, um and then later on, you know, we'll see, unlike Rogue One, there are like consequences <laughs> for for his actions in doing this, but, um, he, uh, it's, yeah, it's, I, I, I totally agree that you nailed it with that. It's just the, the beginning of a, of a rip. we know how it ends. And so this is what would be like, you know, the prequel introduction to our character. So, um, we going into this show, we know he dies a hero and has that, that full transformation. So it's, it's really interesting to see the, um, where he's coming from, uh, to start. And, um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't have much to add to that. I, I, I think, uh, I think that was a good point, Robert. You know, it's it's we're kind of starting off the sort of the same way we start off in Rogue One. Um, we're getting reintroduced to to Cassian in this way, uh, knowing that he's. I think yeah, antihero is is, you know, the the perfect way to describe him because, uh, you know, if we didn't know the the events of Rogue One and how that ends, you know, we think Cassian is just, <laughs> you know, a, a villain yeah. basically. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even though, uh, he might, you know, even though he's like vehemently against the empire, doesn't mean you can't be a bad person, you know? So, um, I think that's, uh, uh, we, it's good for the audience, you know, if they're watching the show and they maybe forgot, they saw Rogue One a long time ago and forgot, or, or they, maybe they didn't see, haven't seen Rogue One, and they're just going to this blind. 
it's good for the it's good for the audience to to be introduced to him that way. Um, so in these in these episodes, we're also getting flashbacks. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the first one we see uh, his sister um, uh, Carrie with uh, with all the Alpha children. Uh, they they watch this this starship crash uh, into the mountains. Um, uh, it, 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 we get a look, first look at, you know, what their, what their life was like. Um, we get, we get a look at the, you know, the people and the, and the setting and, um, like we see like right away the, the, t- like Cassie and, and his sister have, have lived a life of hardship, you know, for, for a very long time since their childhood. Um, so I think the show does a good job of, I think the flashbacks do a good job of establishing that and, and giving us sort of a, a history. Um, a history lesson into, uh, you know, why are they in this place that they're in and why, why do they act the way that they do, um, uh, that, that eventually leads someone like Cassian to, uh, you know, working with the, working the, with the rebellion. Um, uh, so we get, we get, we get a, we get a flashback like that. Then we flashback to the present. We meet, uh, you know, uh, Cassian's uh, little robot buddy. He calls him B, but his his, his full name is B two E M O, B two emo. I don't know, he doesn't. <laughs> he's sort of an emo droid. Uh, he's he's a little emotional. Um, I wouldn't call him full emo though. But yeah, we, he calls him B B two. Um, so he he's bugging Andor. He's like, where where were you? And Andor is like refusing to to tell him, and uh, you know. B tells tells him like you know a bunch of guys are looking for him and uh, uh and, and 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 Cassie is basically like hey can you lie for me <laughs> do you have <laughs> and it's I it was kind of funny it's like you know the the droid like needs he's like do you have enough power to lie you know it's like he needs <laughs> some awesome. extra yeah he's like yes I've I've uh, I have some reserves that I can use to lie <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, it, obviously you can tell that, that he, he requests him to lie a lot. Um, uh, and or later goes into town. He meets, uh, he meets Brasso outside of, uh, outside of his workplace and he tells him to lie too. So, you know, a bunch of people are looking for Andor. he owes a bunch of people money. Uh, it's not a surprise, obviously, like. There's not, there's, we don't get really specifics as to like, like everyone he owes money to or why he owes them money. You just know this is the type of guy that's like always on the run and always, uh, fending, trying to fend for himself. And, mm-hmm. and you know, that it, uh, it involves him lying and, and, uh, you know, squeezing people out of money, um, and, uh, always trying to get away. So I, I think, um, uh, establishing that, that sort of, relationship with all these these people he 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 associates himself with and he runs into um it just it 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 really shows us what ty- what what kind of place Cassian is and uh, what place he is in life to where he he's how desperate he is uh to try and uh to try and get ahead and and, and at the same time fight back you know fight the power, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, so yeah, what are you guys thoughts on, on, on that? My initial thought is I love B. B is like a yes. <laughs> really fun droid to look at. Like just the, the, like the, the way they, they built it is so it it's, it's really interesting the way it kind of like, is like an accordion kind of look and like the, the head oh, kind of yeah. can move up and yeah, down. It's like a cake. It's got different tiers. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the way he spins inside. <laughs> the way he spins yeah. inside. Yes, I love that. I love that. Yeah. So that's my. He's he's already my favorite character in the show. So I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if anyone's gonna top him for me. And I like how he can talk too. He kind of almost looks like a. Uh, kind of almost looks like a like an R two D two type droid, a little different. But um, it's interesting to see a droid like that talk. Uh, so, um, and kind of have its own personality that's separate from other droids and i think that's something that star wars does so well is give those droids like their own individual personalities i, I really don't see too many droids that are exactly the same um so uh yeah big big fan of b robert yeah i 
I was interested in how how they built out how Andor seems to have this really tight social network that he's got all of these friends who have been willing to stick their necks out for him in the past. And all of them seem to be like at the end of the rope. And it's like, okay, I've given you time. I've given you money. I've given you like all the trust that I can manage. And, and you've just squandered it all. Mm -hmm. And, and so Andor is out of resources, even though he's a, a very socially connected guy. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and it, yeah, he's, he's someone that's like, I think you, you, you really, you made a good point. He's someone that's really resourceful. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, he doesn't have time to, or the, you know, n not to, uh, uh, he's resourceful, but he also doesn't have the resources, you know? So he's, he, that's a good way of putting he, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He, he doesn't have the time to establish himself. Uh, and it's not just time. It's he, he's, he's also not in a position being, you know, having to hide his identity. Um, uh, and, and, and what comes along with that? Like it, it, it it does a good job of showing like how he's not just someone who is ba like bamboozling people and, and, and just trying to get by. Like he has, he has a, he has a mission. It's not defined yet. You know, obviously this is a, that's a big part of this show and, and what we're sort of going to uh, grow toward. But uh, I think they balance that sort of desperation and uh, his like street smarts and, uh and like bits of you know flashes of his heroism I, I i think we're already seeing it and and i think i think the show does a good job of establishing that um so soon after that we meet uh our our antagonist uh he's this pre-more deputy inspector uh cyril karn and then uh just just to kind of for time's sake, not to get into uh, the specifics, like basically what happens, his boss tells him to cover up the murders, uh, cover up the, the murder of the two guards, uh, basically so he doesn't have to explain it to uh, the, the, uh, the Imperial Regional Command and uh, so that they can look, they, they keep, looks like their crime rates are down and, and all that, and that they died heroes. Uh, but you know, he's a stickler. <laughs> he's a, <laughs> Cyril's a stickler. Uh, and uh, he is just on a manhunt. Uh, so we kind of, in these first three episodes, and then um, obviously going forward, uh, he's basically our main antagonist. And he's on a manhunt. He needs to find out who this, uh, who this guy is and hunt him down um basically a power a power move um uh yeah so what did you guys think of Cyril so did either of you guys get like uh, the actor really reminded me of Kyle MacLachlan so i was getting like agent dale cooper from twin peaks twin peaks <laughs> but crossed with like uh uh inspector javert from les mis in mm -hmm. in terms of his character i yeah. i just <laughs> I, he might be my favorite character so far. I, yeah. He's just like, I don't know. I love a, a well, a well-motivated flawed villain. Mm -hmm. He's committed. He's committed. Yeah. I think it's, it's funny to see that just like going, <laughs> he's like, I, I got to figure it out. This is, this is, yeah. I, I, I think that that part is, is fun. I, I agree with you. I love those kind of villains that like, they just, they just need answers. So it's, uh, it's um, it's fun, and the and where they where they take them from there is is a lot of fun as well. So yeah, big fan. I'm excited to see see what happens with. It. Yeah, I love his character. I mean, he could easily be just an annoying, you know, like, mm -hmm. hey, uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna do this for the, uh, the empire, or, or I'm just gonna do this to, to look good, um, so I could get promoted. You know, yeah, that is like part of it for him, but like he. Uh, as we as we see him more throughout the you know by the end of episode three, like I agree, he's like he's 
his performance is really, mm-hmm. really, really good. And, and he's, it's, he's more complete. He's bringing more to the table than just like this, you know, like by the book, you know, I, I will stop at nothing to get, uh, you know, the enemy sort of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Cause he could have easily fell into that trap uh, yeah. as we've seen in, in a lot of movies and a lot of other shows. So, uh, yeah, I, I I was really impressed uh, by his character and and yeah, however long he he's the I mean I'm sure there'll be multiple antagonists so they're they're planning multiple seasons for the show but mm. ho- however long we uh, we stay with him um, I think I think we're in for for a, a good ride. Um, mm. He feels like a, an already more fleshed out Hux from uh, you know ah uh, yeah yeah um, yeah. So I, I feel like I already I feel like he's already has more motivation than Hux in in the show in the first couple episodes. Of it. So it's uh it's interesting to see. Um, but yeah, great character. Really, I, really I, fun. I agree with that. Um, yeah, so we uh, we meet Cyril and then we also meet uh, Bix Kayleen. Uh, she she owns a salvage yard. She's a mechanic uh, and we see right away an obvious uh, friend uh, and someone who Cassian trusts um, to a point at least. Um, so he visits her at her garage and she notices that, uh, you know, he's, he notices his injury from, from uh, his scuffle with the, the guards. And uh, again, we're seeing Cassian in, in his, in sort of desperation mode. And he's like, mm-hmm. he needs, he needs to sell, uh, something immediately uh and uh you know she gives him the whole spiel like hey you know how i operate and he's like i need this now uh and uh so she's very reluctant um but you know cassian is determined and, and convinces her um because she sees like he's he's in a rough spot like rougher than usual um uh we meet uh tim carlo uh uh who is uh, uh, Bix's boyfriend, lover, whatever is kind of weird. <laughs> the relationship, <laughs> <laughs> employee, yeah, yeah. Em- yeah, an employee at the <laughs> same time. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it was very, yeah. It, it, it's more complicated than than just a uh, uh, you know boyfriend girlfriend situation. But mm-hmm. um, we meet him, uh, and. Uh, you know, Andor can see that. I guess, I guess this was his first time realizing that they were a thing. Um, so then he asked him if he knows anything about uh, clandestine work. Um, but then Bix reassures him that 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 he knows nothing. Um, so he, he that was just his way of like, hey, okay, how much does this guy know? Um, but uh, he he talks. Uh, Cassian talks to Tim about. Um, you know, finding a, a life partner, and then we get a flashback of uh, Andor and his tribe participating in an initiation ceremony, which involves like painting black stripes on their faces. And um, uh, we get, and then we jump to Cyril uh, again, and he's ta- he's tasking a signals officer with tracking into a ship. Um, and uh, he notices something on the screen, and he basically is like, "Yeah, you need to." Let's find out more about this this ship here, uh, and if you want to keep your job, basically threatening him. Um, and uh, we we jump back to Bix. She tells uh, Tim that she's gonna run some errands. I mean, she tends to do that a lot. As <laughs> and you know, Tim obviously uh, is suspicious, curious. Uh, she you know he follows her through the streets. Um, Sees that she she visits a dealer, uh, telling him that she's you know looking for a Bendine mesh tech filter. Gosh, these these oh, names. Of course, so, you need that. They, yeah, of course. Yeah, he t- he tells her that it's in uh, the yellow racks in the back, and she heads to the garage, climbs up a ladder, and then she taps into the circuit box. She um, never goes for the Bendine mesh tech filter. No. But- no, <laughs> you would think like, she would, right? That's a I very mean, she important she part. Would. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah. So I mean, yeah. This is just, this is basically you know we 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 get to meet Bix. We 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 meet Tim. We see their relationship. Um, and we see that Tim is a little, you know, at least curious and interested in in what's really going on with Bix. Um, uh, which obviously plays into uh, later circumstances uh, in the other episodes. But um, yeah, I just wanted to get your guys' uh, quick thoughts on uh, on Bix and Tim and, um, uh, you know, these, these first uh, few scenes that we, uh, we see them in. I mean, Tim is clearly the model of jealousy in, mm-hmm. in I mean... You see it in episode one. It it really develops in the next couple of episodes, and um, I, it's a simple role, but he played it well, and and I just really believed it as his as his motivation. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, you can definitely tell he, he's it's yeah it's yeah he's yeah very very quiet character could also be jealous because he's the first character named tim in star wars he's got two normal names tim <laughs> carlo um, uh, so you know maybe, never trust a guy with two jealous. first names yeah he doesn't have like the the cool star wars name i don't know maybe <laughs> that's what i'm just kidding but the uh but yeah it's um interesting i like i like how they show that that's and how they i I really like that's how they, that's how they show the dynamic between the three of them is like Cassian and Bix have their own thing, and then like this guy's kind of on the outside, and we don't know much about him. We don't know much about Bix either, but since we already know um, Cassian, it feels like she's a little more familiar, and then he feel really feels like he's on the outside. But you can feel that that jealousy. So, uh, yeah, yeah, simple, but it's a. It, I I think it was a really interesting way to uh, start it off. Yeah. At first, I thought Bix was Andor's sister. And, um, it took a little while to, to, to figure out, oh no, no, she's like an ex lover or something. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, she's one of these, um, super competent people though. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you can see why everyone's attracted to her. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, she's, yeah, she's very attractive, but she's, uh, yeah, she's, she knows She's very resourceful in her own in her own right. She obviously has this connection to Cassian, um, and uh, yeah, the jealousy is very, very, very apparent um, mm-hmm. on screen. And uh, I think it, it's a good, you know, as we get into the events of episode two and three, um, this sort of really sets the, uh, sets it up, sets it, sets Tim's character up well for for how he for some of the decisions that he makes, um, in the next, uh, couple episodes. Um, so the first episode ends, uh, we, we, we go back to Cyril and, and he's, you know, he's, he's asking his, uh, analysts if they, they got any leads on any Canary males. Um, and, uh, the, I mean, just the planet Canary itself, they don't have much information about it. Uh, the, the most recent census dating they have, uh, dates back to just six years ago, and but you know Cyril's determined. That's an eternity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> six years. Um, yeah, I mean, he's determined. Still, I mean, he's he he. Obviously, we know he's motivated. He's he's he will stop at nothing to to find uh, Cassian. Um, so he issues an order for uh, Kanari human men on Ferrex to be questioned. Um, so. Back on Ferrix, uh, we uh, we meet Pegla, this bearded guy. He meets with Andor uh, on his uh, on his transport, and he asks Andor, "What what is he doing?" You know, and he tells him that uh, that he's you know in the office, and and Andor tells him that he he has refueled the ship, and but he notices that Andor has swapped the ship's chip logs. Uh, Zorbi, his boss, uh, speaks over the. Uh, the uh, overhead projectors and asks Pegla to explain what's going on. Uh, he says the yard rats are back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Zorby tells him to deal with a customer and and to set the hounds on the rats. And um, uh, Andor asks if he could borrow the ship, but you know Pegla is he's unwilling to to get involved. Um, he tells Andor to finish his work and and 
don't come back. Uh, uh, so then we end with a flashback. We, we see a young uh, Cassian with his tribe, and they're gathering supplies uh, from that fallen ship that we saw in the beginning in the first flashback. Uh, and his sister, uh, she wants to come, but she's too young. And, and, and or promises that, that he'll return. Um, so that's how we wrap up the, the first episode. So, um, yeah, what did you think? What did you think of how it ended? And, um, uh, just overall, like wrapping up your thoughts on this first episode of, of Andor. I think the way that it ended was, um, uh, I thought that was, it was cool to, to see the flashback. I, I, I've been enjoying the flashbacks to see like what kind of, what has, has, has pushed him to be this way because it's a, like we said, it's a, we, we get him in rogue one at a very different place, uh, still similar characteristics, but very different. Um, and I think that's something that almost threw me off. I wasn't expecting him to be this kind of character in the, at the beginning of the show. I thought he would still have some, he almost seems like he doesn't have redeemable, uh, uh, characteristics to him. Um, but we, you know, we, we know who he, he becomes. Uh, so it was, there's a very uh, limited number of people he cares about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I, 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 you know, I think that that end kind of shows, uh, you know, that he's, needs to try and like make some decisions for himself you know like what kind of person is he going to be you know see um so uh yeah i overall that that the 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 whole show is um that that this pilot episode of it has uh i've i've really liked the scale of it overall i think that it really does some cool star wars building um as far as like what everything looks like i really feel like i can like go in there and touch everything um um, like just, I'm big on the visuals. So the visuals for the show have been like incredible. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're, yeah, I think that, that those, that's, that's my, my take on the, uh, the first episode really. Yeah, I agree. The visual, the visuals are, are gorgeous mm. and, and the performances are great by mm. the way. It's, I mean, all, all of the actors are fantastic. Um, I guess I'm, I'm just left with. I mean, the survival mo motive is really good for Andor, but it started with him looking for his sister, and then he never mentions his sister again. Um, we get it in the flashbacks, mm -hmm. but we don't... He never seems to have an impulse to, I've got to do something to make sure I don't lose track of my sister. Um, it's all, I might get caught, I need to run. And, and maybe that's, maybe that's part of the care character that they're, uh, establishing with him, but yeah, I'm hoping he gets more redeemable. Um, I'm hoping he, he shows that he really does care about somebody besides himself. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we'll definitely get there. I mean, how many seasons or episodes it takes, uh, that's to be determined. But, um, yeah, we definitely have to revisit this sister situation in the present. Uh, that's for sure. Um, uh, and I think his sort of, I mean, my guess or, or what my prediction would be, we're really, we're really going to see more of, uh, of his, uh, positive traits and, and, and heroic qualities, uh, as he gets more and more involved with the rebellion and, um, you know, if that's something that's going to, th that they're going to stretch out, uh, for a long period of time, or is he going to just be like, uh, this guy who just borders on being, well, not just borders on being a criminal. I mean, he is a criminal, uh, <laughs> he is literally a criminal on the run. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, that's yet to be determined, but I think, you know, uh, I would assume that, that we'll, we'll start seeing that sooner rather than later, because again, we know how the story ends. We know he dies a hero. Um, uh, but it will be interesting to see if, uh, you know, th this world that they're opening up, it, it, it also allows for other characters that we haven't met yet, or, or maybe characters we've met briefly, like, um, 
in in solo maybe or or other characters that we met in, in rogue one uh uh to 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 appear on this show and to flesh them out as well so i think i think andor is is obviously cassian is is the the lead and and the focal point of the story um but i think there's a lot of uh a lot of space for other characters to be introduced um and to sort of expand the the star wars universe um so getting into the second episode um uh we cassian uh visits with uh marva and or uh, we haven't talked about her yet she's she's basically his adoptive mother um and uh you know after he visits with her and and you know tells her like he has this facial injury from he tripped on a cable uh while helping helping uh pegla and uh you know doing his bs routine um mm -hmm. but uh, you know marva is like b2 can you please tell cassian <laughs> you know what what you told me earlier and and that's when b2 uh you know reveals uh the the uh premore authorities uh order and search uh, for a canary male um and i was like listen no one should know that you're born in canary right you haven't told anyone that um and then uh he he's you know he's like struggling to answer and then she's like okay uh you're probably in a lot of trouble now because if anyone knows that you were uh that you're art can canari then obviously you're screwed um so you know marva d chides him and uh, you know for for spilling his secrets uh you know to his lovers and 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 demands to know that that you know how how did they learn of his origins and and he admits that he finally admits that it was it was him um and uh but and that's when b2 uh inform b uh informs andor that bix has been trying to contact him um and uh but before he can tell him the the droid powers down uh and then when marva asks cassian like what did you do he's like i i messed up <laughs> in his words hmm. um uh then he meets uh, he, he leaves he meets up with bix tells her about what happened um and uh that's when he offers to sell her like his prized possession this he has this piece of technology that uh you know th uh that he'll give her and and re in return for 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 help to to escape to to leave uh go off world um and uh she says okay the buyer is gonna come tomorrow and uh tim is watching <laughs> tim is always watching <laughs> um yeah so uh yeah just a few thoughts on uh, on marva um and uh this uh this this whole scene here uh where he's obviously learning about this search um and uh again him being in an even more desperate uh, situation that he was already in yeah, Marvel Marvel reveals reveals a lot. yeah Marvel's <laughs> yeah i like that <laughs> yeah she reveals a lot more dirt about cassian right in the beginning she really starts like you know talking about more uh uh you know more more women that he's that he's been yep. with and mm -hmm. you know revealing that he's like he just he lies a lot he's you know she really but she's she kind of she catches him in that stuff too so it's um it's uh yeah i think she's a she's also another you know another cool fun character that um is in there it's it's funny to see a somebody that he's like he can't really get around almost <laughs> very much a mother figure mm -hmm. yeah 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 totally and yeah again like you mentioned uh uh robert the performances are great and and mm -hmm. the actress who plays marva i don't have her name in front of me right now but she does she's really really good um mm -hmm. um yeah the i echo everything you guys said um but moving along we we you know tim sees this and uh you know he has he has some drinks he has to uh 
to a communication terminal and he he's uh he sees that uh well we see several uh an uh, pre more analysts they receive a tip call from Tim. Uh, and based on the call, the team checks on Cassian's records and they see all his crimes, you know, destroying Imperial property, assaulting an Imperial officer, you know, uh, and, and Cyril seeing all this. And he's just like grinning. He's like, oh, this is the guy. Like, <laughs> you know, he's, it's like slowly being revealed to him. Like, oh, this, oh, this has to be the guy. Is this guy, you know, from Canari. Um, uh so you know they bring up his image and and uh and we see the hostess from the brothel come in so all the pieces are coming together um uh and we see later it's actually good police work i mean <laughs> the guy's doing the conducting a good investigation mm -hmm. yeah it really is yeah i mean he has a guy on the inside now um uh so we see tim uh he, Bix comes to see him, uh, you know, has trouble sleeping and notices the lights on and, uh, you know, then Bix starts seducing Tim uh, in this moment. Again, we're in a very adult world now in <laughs> Star Wars. Uh, yeah, you know, it's not, this is not like Game of Thrones or HBO level type, you know, uh, scenes that we're talking about. But like, this is, you know, for Star Wars, it's, it's, it's more than we've ever seen and and uh definitely on a disney live action show a disney plus live action series uh or in any mm -hmm. of the the theatrical releases um uh so there's that scene very obvious what's what's going on uh we see car and he's visited by sergeant linus mosk uh who is reported for duty uh at midnight uh, he tells him to act quickly because they have a dangerous sub, uh, suspect. Um, and they're discussing this, this operation, you know, uh, th this, this search for, for Cassian. And, and Mostek said they'll need, you know, 12, 12 men. And, uh, and they invite him, they, uh, they invite Karn to join the operation to, to boost morale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the that two, works so well. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> the, you you could tell. Yeah, they were really they really got the motivation they needed. Um, <laughs> yeah, they they all they agreed they need to avenge the death of their colleagues because um, this is what it's all about, right? Uh, so, um, uh, Musk describes the corporate tactical forces as the Galactic Empire's first line of defense. <laughs> and emphasizes the need to mount a show of strength. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, we we meet this other guy who's also very, I mean, very motivated, very uh, a company man, basically, <laughs> uh, who uh, is like just, uh, I mean, obviously someone that is going to be loyal and and will fight you know, to the bitter end, uh, <laughs> because, you know, if you believe you are the galactic empire's first line of defense, like the, <laughs> that just tells you right away what, <laughs> who we're dealing with. So, uh, so yeah, what, what did you guys think of mosque and, uh, um, uh, this, uh, and, and also what do you guys think of, you know, we're seeing more of Tim's involvement in this case. I mean, mosques MO is to sort of escalate everything that he touches and so i love how he takes uh karn's enthusiasm and his his loyalty to his comrades and kicks it up a notch and and uh he's clearly he's clearly got some experience doing this yeah um yeah, I uh, I agree. They must have great benefits or something going on there because it's just uh, <laughs> these guys. These guys love their work, man. Um, uh, yeah, and I think the um, you know learning a little bit more about about Tim, um, Tim and and Bix is uh, uh, it's it's interesting because I think it it just kind of shows the uh, again it, it keeps adding to what we were saying about about Tim and his his jealousy and he's. Uh, he, it, it's certainly, they're certainly showing that, that, that Tim has some, uh, he's got something that he's dealing with, you know, 
where uh you know it it shows him uh uh you know he's he's drinking a lot he keeps showing up to different places like that it's um uh and his his need to his uh his jealousy is um uh being like really being shown in this these uh these scenes is uh it's very um yeah it shows that he, he's got a little more inside of his character than than what we've we've seen so far and there's there's probably a reason reason for why he is uh uh acting these ways so definitely yeah uh, and we see uh, as we see later in the episode you know we there's that guy who was in the beginning too that was beating that metal slab with the hammer you know, oh, it was kind of like the, oh, the that, was, that, that, was, that, that, that was, was really cool, cool. <laughs> that was great yeah, I mean, there's no way that was sufficient ear protection for him, but no, not. But it was so awesome. <laughs> I thought the same thing. I'm like, yeah, like man, that's Star Wars must have some noise canceling technology we don't have yeah. yet. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, he, we see him beat this metal slab uh, uh, again, um, and uh, Bix wakes up. Uh, Tim is just sitting there <laughs> creepily. <laughs> uh, he couldn't sleep. Right. Um, and uh, is, and you know, like this has to be like the, the least creative name for a caffeinated drink in star Wars. Oh, yes, it's like, yes, yes. It's like, can yeah. I get some calf? Can I get like, some calf? They, they couldn't just say coffee or they could have <laughs> said, they couldn't say caffeine. They just went with calf. I you think know. calf has been mentioned in in some other Star Wars material before. Maybe a, maybe a book or or something. I've definitely I think I've heard it in Star Wars. It's uh, definitely before. made a lot of appearances. Yeah. So yeah, if yeah. if you if you look it up on Wikipedia, it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah yeah. It's been in the books. Uh, it's been on uh, I guess some some episodes of Rebels. I th- it looks like okay. Um. So yeah, it's uh, again like this was my. This was my first time realizing, you know, what, like what calf is or what it was or, or, mm. or giving it any attention. I'm like, yeah. that's just so lazy. Like, just, you could just say, <laughs> but, you know, can I get some coffee? <laughs> well, apparently like coffee and calf have both appeared in the star Wars universe. Mm-hmm. And so there's supposed to be different beverages. Oh, and uh, I'm not sure what the difference is, but, but on the next episode calf is more I... popular than coffee. We'll yeah. do a whole episode. We'll do a deep dive on calf uh, on a later later episode. But we totally should. <laughs> yeah, um, but I noticed yeah, a few I'm, little I'm things like that too, like things that are like normal everyday things that have been mentioned in Star Wars or in Star Wars as well. Like um, in that one scene, there's a guy eating out of like the almost looks like a Chinese takeout container. He's like <laughs> eating right. lunch, yes. and I was like. Okay, all right. They got takeout in Star Wars now. It's it makes sense. We're seeing more of like the everyday lives of these people. Um, so uh, stuff like that. I, I I think it's it's really fun. Um, just fun details that are like, oh, it's not yeah. it's not that much different. It's a long time ago, but <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's not, not that, that far away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so Tim offers her this, you know, calf, uh, you know, when, when she wakes up and, um, you know, she tells him again, like, I got to run some errands. Can you open up the yard for me? Uh, so it's like, again, Tim knows there's something else going on. Um, and, uh, we, uh, we see that, you know, it's, this is not gonna, like this sort of shtick is not gonna last long uh f- for for Bix or 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 Cassian in that case um uh we see Andor he he's he's chatting with B and and uh uh he's looking for some comms and uh you know B is like being nosy he's like why do you need comms uh he he asks about like uh uh where's Marva's credits that you know Andor stole <laughs> obviously because he he's he's obviously taking money to to try and get away um, but he tells, you know, he tells me like, Hey, we, we don't want anyone else finding her money. Right. So, um, he, the droid agrees, B agrees. Uh, he, he does try to advise Andor for running away, but Andor says that, uh, he should return less Marva worry about his whereabouts. So, uh, asking him to, uh, to, to lie again and, and to, to, to not, he doesn't need to know basically, uh, where he's going. 
um we uh Andorra goes to meet with uh, Zanwan. Zanwan, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, he's a uh, funny character. I mean, uh, he's arguing with an alien customer when he's greeting him. Uh, <laughs> uh, named Granik. Um, uh, basically, he meets up with him so he could, uh, you know, get tr travel out of there uh, to, to uh, Tassar. He's like, how much is it going to cost to to get me there but you know on really short notice and and basically full secrecy like no one needs to know that i'm on on the ship um they settle on a price 700 credits um and then we we jump to a uh pre more security starship uh going through hyperspace and uh, we 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 see Mosk again. He's he's briefing the troops about Andor. He's uh, warning them that he's dangerous. Uh, he divides the 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 task force into three teams. Um, so with him and him and Karn leading the West team, uh, so they have a plan to ambush him uh, with a pincer movement. Um, and uh, you know Moss warns him that they there some of the locals might not be cooperative and and to remind them about a monthly territorial forum to raise their complaints <laughs> uh so yeah we're like we're getting a lot of great like like stuff uh you know first of all again with this sort of t this task force you know and and someone like mosk believing that he's th that they're the empire's first line of defense like we're seeing like uh the the little people you know on this show and and, and how they how they operate the little people uh, you know in the empire and then the little people uh, that are uh soon to be you know part of the rebellion little people that are just trying to survive um so we see people like this who 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 uh, you know uh, on in one instant you know can seem very like powerful and and threatening and smart <laughs> you know but 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 then we see like sort of that veil come off as like they are just a little guy you know that but they're trying to you know work their way up or or just put on a uh, put on an appearance that they're really important or you know they were or i mean in the case of mosque it's obviously that he was brainwashed you know by the empire um to to, to feel that or to have to have the sense of like importance that he's doing something, you know, that's, that's making a difference. Um, obviously that's, that's a tactic that, that works in real life <laughs> that works, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that we've seen the empire do before. Uh, we've seen other characters like him take their job way too seriously. Um, and think that they have worth. Um, and for some people like they'll think they're the most important guy in the room. And then, you know, after one meeting with someone like Darth Vader just snaps their neck in an instant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, or, or, you know, if you're someone like Snoke, you just get, you know, your head chopped off. Uh, uh, so gosh, where was I? So he tell, he tells them, uh, again, this whole thing about taking pride in their team there's no easy route to success and justice. I just love Karn's speech about that, where he's trying to like where Moss tells Karn like uh, to Cyril to talk to the team, <laughs> and, and, he, and he's he's obviously like making this all up as he goes along. He's like, <laughs> yeah. There's and the force clap at the end was was great. Um, yeah. Uh, I was getting very um sort of vietnam vibes from mm. from that you know like the the inexperienced officer you know the officer who's coming out of school and knows a lot but doesn't have any like on the ground experience and doesn't know how to connect with the troops and and especially you know getting into episode three um you know with the the guerrilla tactics that that go on there but also thinking back to to Rogue One, which had a lot of sort of Vietnam allusions with the the jungle setting and the the uh, and so on, 
and I wonder how deliberate or conscience conscious that was um, on their part. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that's um, I would I, w- I would imagine like especially just a show like this. I- I'm sure they took a lot of just in general, and we'll probably see more of it. A lot of inspiration from like war history in general, uh, yeah. and um, because that's you know the writers of the show if they're if they're going to uh, portray wartime uh, in Star Wars universe, that's that's sort of the uh inspiration and and the context that they ha- you know can derive from uh as far as like real real world experience um and to ground a show like this obviously this is a show that's very very uh grounded it's not really about the the spectacle as like the theatrical movies are um or or you know even a show like like Mandalorian like yeah it's it's grounded in in some senses, but it's still a lot about the spectacle, you know, it's still, Mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to get, I would assume, you know, we're not going to get like that Luke Skywalker cameo, you know, in this sort of show or these big sweeping, uh, you know, starships blasting at each other. Uh, you know, this is a very like boots on the ground wartime, uh, sort of show. So I think, um, yeah, I, I would, I would, I would totally buy into uh, um, that sort of notion that that they're 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 taking from real real uh, war wartime stories and experiences uh, uh, in in American history and and, and you know the global history. Oh yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, the the second episode ends. We uh, we see Ryle. Uh, <coughs> he's, he's on a hover bus, and uh, this passenger who's getting chatty with him um you know basically complaining about all the fees all the docking fees um he's complaining about the spaceport authorities and um oh i used to be able to travel freely on the planet when i was younger you know <laughs> <laughs> uh you know Raul's like mostly ignoring him and just sort of nodding and uh uh, but there's that line that the episode ends with, uh, where he tells Raul is like, if 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 you can't if you can't find it here, it's not worth finding. And then we see that the shot of the hover bus, uh, you know, landing on uh, about to land on Ferrix. So we're about to see uh, this, you know, how uh, you know Raul and Cassian meet. Um, so uh, as this episode wraps up, uh, any general thoughts on uh, on that? um and uh and the whole uh you know the serial the the serial motivating his troops uh (laughs) up until the end of this episode any any thoughts on that (laughs) i think for a show that has such a uh such a it has like a very tense overall feel to it so uh sometimes like the like that's that's the one thing that i've really started to pick up on in, in episode two is that like everything just feels tense um and uh Mm -hmm. so sometimes i think like there's like it's fun like when we talk back about certain moments in it it's like oh yeah these were these were like funny comedic moments but like sort of in the in the show it almost doesn't play off as as a comedic moment but like yeah i'm still like laughing about it but there's some there's just an overall tense um uh there's just this overall tension going on throughout the show that's uh yeah that's just a you it's kind of very feel present. the oppression of mm-hmm. the empire in a way yeah. that, in a in a way that I haven't anyway in any mm-hmm. other Star Wars show or or movie. I, the the guy who was talking to Rael, I forget his name, but um, you know, he said he was trying to spark up conversation, and he goes, "You know, I understand. You don't want to talk. You never know who you're talking to," and mm-hmm. and that was a really telling line. I thought. Oh, absolutely. Um, And was that the first, was that, that has to be one of the first fedoras we've seen in Star Wars as well, right? Could be. Uh, That is a great, great observation. I I can't tell you, uh, uh, yeah, I can't think of it. That that, that might have been the first fedora. Um, Now we just need a bullwhip somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. That would be the crossover of the millennium. (laughs) 
Um, uh, so episode three, uh, we see uh, Ryle uh, meet up with Bix, and they're talking about this whole Cassian situation, and and uh, you know Ryle has a lot of questions about um, like, well, do they have his? Do they know his name? Do they know like? Uh, you know, all his records say he's from Fest. Um, and you know, they uh, has he been, you know, basically, you know, says like not many people know so that he's been I- identified. So, uh, Raul like realizes, okay, they have to act fast. Um, so they, uh, she tells him, like, yeah, he's uh, Cassian's in the building nine on the east lot or whatever and uh says like he'll be there um and then we meet up with uh we're we're back on the 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 morlana starship um it exits hyperspace and we see uh uh three mobile tack pods carrying law enforcement personnel led by uh, Deputy Inspector Cyril Karn and Sergeant Linus Mosk. Uh, and we see B2 racing through the streets of Ferrix. Um, uh, we get a flashback with uh, with Marva and her husband, uh, Clem, Clem Andor. Uh, and uh, they're on a mission to their salvaging equipment uh, from that Rex starship. Uh, and they're only have like a 20 minute they only have 20 minutes because there's it's very radioactive uh and the the conditions around the the starship uh and and on the planet um and marva believes that there are six brand new fuel nodules in the ship clem thinks they should leave but marva wants to investigate uh this banging sound that she hears and uh they um uh they find uh they f- uh they find a young canary boy wrecking equipment and, and screens in the engine room and uh uh you know Cle- clem says that he likes the boy's spirit um but warns that he might not want to be here when they come to clean up so um cassian does not understand <laughs> clem and, and marva uh so he waves his staff at them um and uh uh b2 warns that a Repub- republic uh free gay is approaching um marva attempts to communicate with with cassian uh and then clem warns that they have nine minutes before the republic starship arrives um so to save him uh marva gets b2 to bring a, a drowser uh and clem points out that the boys people are on the planet and uh marva counters that and says that the tribe have already killed the Republic officer and that the Republic would retaliate when the frigate lands. So Marva stuns Cassian with her drowser. Uh, we get back to the present and uh, uh, Karn and Moss tack pods approach the Ferrix settlement and land outside the scrapyard. West team joins North team. Workers believe the corporate soldiers are hunting for someone. Karn and his uh, forces enter the streets of Perix from different sites. Um, so we're seeing their sort of, uh, strategy here. Uh, a team enters Marva's home, uh, and, uh, tells her that they have a war for Cassian and or, uh, they restrain her and, and, uh, uh, they restrain her and then they enter the house and then we cut to Bix. Uh, she goes, she goes back to Tim's office and asks why all this stuff's piled up in the alley. And, you know, Tim says he forgot, uh, uh, and then we get back to Marva. She chastises Karn and his troops for searching her home. She Karn replies that she can stop the search by helping them find Andor. Uh, so Mosk arrives with B2. Karn orders his troops to pull the droid's power supply uh, to force to try and force uh, the droid's cooperation. Marva protests, but Karn orders one of his soldiers to silence her. Cassian contacts B2 by comlink. Sensing something's not right, so he cryptically tells B2 and Marva that he's sorry and to make sure that she keeps the heat. 
Uh, while a soldier attempts to track Cassian's signal, Karn and his troops notice a crowd gathering outside Marva's home. Karn calls East Team for reinforcements and assigns some of his men with guarding Marva and B2. Uh, so, yeah. What are your thoughts on, um, you know, that up to this point uh, in this third episode? Um, we, we, we get to meet Clem. Uh, we get to see, uh, we're seeing Marva being, you know, apprehended and questioned. And uh, we get to see this sort of flashback to Marva and, and, and Clem's encounter with, uh, with Cassian. Uh, so uh, what did you think of these uh, first few scenes so far? We didn't actually talk much about the flashbacks in episode two. And... And we saw a lot of Andor's character in the way he was following the the troop of of I guess the tribe the 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 residents of the planet, um, but he he wasn't very good at following orders even then, and um, when the leader gets killed, he kind of hangs back instead of like going back to the camp with everyone else. And he starts this episode by entering into the crash ship. And um, there's this really interesting moment where he sees himself reflected in some of the control panels or something. And um, his reaction is to start smashing it. He wants to smash the reflection and smash all the equipment. And that's what draws Marva and Clem. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting, I don't know, character moment. Um, that even at that young age, there was something, I don't know, just full of wrath and anger and rage in in him. And uh, I, I thought that was really interesting and and how that um i guess i'm looking forward to seeing how how marva kind of uh tempers that for him i don't know yeah i i agree i think that um uh i i really i was really drawn to that moment as well where he started just just smashing stuff right as soon as he saw his face he was just he, he lost it um a couple of things came to my mind are that one, like this could be the first time he's like really seeing a clear ref reflection of his face. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think the, uh, the other one could be um, that he sees himself and he sees just that something that he really doesn't like within himself. Um, and he just, just brings him to that point of, of rage and um, you know, and it could have been with with the event that had just happened where, uh, they had sent, um, they had sent that, that young girl down there to go investigate and then she ends up getting killed. Um, and then they, they all let loose by shooting darts at the guy. Um, and, uh, that was kind of a, a fun scene, but also a sad scene. Um, uh, and so I think that that kind of, um, it really, it's a, it's a good character note for him is showing him that like, this is. It's time to maybe step up. I need to be, maybe I'm not fulfilled in not being a leader, you know, or being, I don't like the way that I, that I am being. So it's a, I, I really liked that. Like just cinematically, I thought that was a really fun, or I, I just thought that was a very, uh, just important, important part. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad like you're, you're pointing out again, these flashbacks were, you know, sometimes when we get flashbacks in a, in a show that they're not always that effective, like sometimes they can just feel like, okay, can we just get on to the, the main story, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, on this show, I think we're, we're getting, you know, a, a lot of it's necessary. I mean, it's, it's, we're obviously seeing uh, Cassian's uh, ties to um, his, you know, adopted mother Marva and, and, and Clem. Uh, and, uh, but also we're seeing, yeah, like how, uh, like we mentioned, uh, near the top of the episode, you know, where, what his childhood is like and, and, and how that's formed him, 
you know, uh, into the man that he is now. Uh, so yeah, I think these flashback scenes are are very welcome and and very uh, necessary, and and I think are 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 serving a really good purpose. Um, uh, getting back to the to the episode, we uh, you know, Raoul uh, meets Andor, um, and uh at at the abandoned warehouse and uh andor tells him that he plans to sell an intact star path unit for 40,000 credits you know because he claims it can track imperial coordinates for 9 parsecs um so andor's like okay pay me <laughs> uh, uh but you know Raul's like okay hold on i got to try it um uh, and he questions him. He, you know, Raul is like, uh, "How did you obtain it? Um, are you an imperial spy? Uh, are you, uh, are you just like a middleman for for someone else who's actually selling it, or are you telling the truth? Are are you are you genuine?" Um, Andor just wants to get paid. He reiterates, you know, like his demand for payment up front and. Uh, but Raul's not, you know, not letting him slide. And uh, uh, he's like, this star path unit is far too valuable. Uh, um, uh, because uh, you know, Raul says, like, he, he uh, he's aware that Andor uh, bribed quartermasters b- before they scrap. Uh, and uh, but he, he, he tells him this is way too valuable for that. And. Again, he asks him, "How do you? How did you obtain this this star path and uh, this star path unit?" And he said he stole it himself. And he's like, "Well, how the heck did you do that?" And he's like, "They have tight security." But Andor is like, "Nope." He's like, "All you need is a uniform." <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you impersonate. Imper- he's like, "They are so full of themselves, and they're so complacent, and they're they're so arrogant that that you know it's really that easy." You know, they, they think they're untouchable. It's like, I just had to grab a uniform and impersonate a, a, an Imperial officer. Um, and that's when Raul's like, oh, you're right. <laughs> they are arrogant. <laughs> yeah. He sees like, okay, the genuine, that he's genuine, like in that, in that moment. And um, so, uh, you, you know, Andor, is like, he wants to count the, the money, but, you know, he, uh, you know, Raul, t- he, he tells him about the cost of, of resisting the empire. And, and he, you know, he mentions that he's aware that, um, Andor's adoptive father, Clem was, was hung, uh, by the empire. Um, and, uh, you know, Raul and, you know, he invites Andor to, to join him. And, and, and he asks Andor, uh, you know, to ask, he asks at gunpoint, how, how, how does he know? so much about him like and was like how do you know so much about me and and uh you know Raul wants to talk to him but warns that you know these forces are on their way <laughs> okay <laughs> mm-hmm. there's you know there you kill two security officers they're they're coming and and he tells him you know Raul says he sees he's like i see potential in you um but you know andor is still like now he's like who the heck are you <laughs> all right um uh, but then Raul is like is like don't have a lot of time okay um and you know cassian asks him like wh- why you know he asks he, he asks hypothetically why would i choose to go with you and and Raul says it's for the opportunity of fight it's for the opportunity to fight back um we go uh back to the streets we see um uh s- several residents uh Salman, Woman, Brasso, they're begging objects to intimidate, you know, the, the corpos and, and the, the, there are several businesses that are closed down. Um, and, uh, we, we see that, you know, they're really ravaged. They're, everyone's bracing themselves for this. Um, and, uh, you know, Cassian is still demanding to know who, who Ral is. And then he asks him whether he's a spy and, Raul says, you know, special people are hard to find and, and that he came to save him from the pyre. 
And then Ral asks him, Ral asks Andor to trust him. And he crushes Andor's comm link, warning him never to carry anything he cannot control. Um, so that's when they sense moving around the warehouse and they realize that they're surrounded. Um, so what do you guys think of uh, this this interaction between Cassian and um, and, and Ryle? Yeah, I think that it uh, it was uh, it was like almost like awkward because they were they were they. They both like Cassian didn't know anything about this guy, but this guy obviously knew like he like did his research on Cassian. Um, so this guy, I don't this guy's not here for this this little box that he's got. Um, this guy's here to to take Cassian with him. So I think it was kind of um it's almost like it's it's just interesting to watch the more like the more he questions him and stuff, and he's got that cool kind of older uh Mm, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say he kind of reminds me of uh, Woody Harrelson's character from from uh, Solo, but a little like a little more toned back mm-hmm. than that. He's kind of just he seems like, you know, he's not a guy you want to mess with. And they they really introduce that with like his epic introduction, like sequence that he has where he like goes and stands on like the the little uh, the little pile of, of dirt or whatever it is. Um, uh, but um, their initial interaction is is good and so i uh you really see that that passion that 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 uh cassian has um and uh yeah he's it's 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 i think it's the first time we really see kind of a a a little bit of a a little bit of a switch a little bit more of like a like he's he's got something else inside of him there so i i I like that a lot yeah this was my favorite my my favorite part of the three episodes was in this warehouse yeah, it was. Uh, I agree. It might be my favorite too. It's. Uh, I mean, again, two brilliant actors mm-hmm. um, that are just uh, you know score uh, sizing each other up. You know, yep. it's it's really it's a really a cool scene uh, where they can just you know uh, chew, chew it up. Um, uh, so you know, back on the streets, you know, they're they're surrounded. They. Uh, um, there's a gun battle and there's all sorts of falling objects they have to dodge you know there's a, a lot of the the soldiers are wounded and and because all this stuff like there's falling chains and all these different random objects um and uh but Cassian wants to uh retrieve this this starpath box um and uh, Ryle tells him like don't do it but he does it anyway Ryle ends up saving him he shoots this, you know, a soldier uh, that that tried to gun down Cassian, and uh, they escape. Uh, but you know, Cassian could not uh, retrieve the box. But you know, the Ryle's like, it's more important that we got out of here. <laughs> you know, like like you mentioned, like mm-hmm. we're not here for this box. Uh, so he, um, uh, we. S- uh, we we see Tim confronting the the soldiers, um, uh, and he tries to help Bix, but he gets shot, <laughs> shot dead. Um, and I think we uh, I, I, I th- we failed to mention. I think there was a scene before this where Bix realizes that Tim is the traitor. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh so that happened. I don't think we have to like go into the deals of that scene, but uh right uh, during during that that interaction between Cassian and um and Ryle, uh there's a scene with uh, Tim and Bix where Bix realizes that 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 Tim is is has betrayed Cassian. Um and well, he ends up dead, right? You know, but and you know, still I mean Bix uh still had feelings for him so she does she, she's really saddened by by this um and uh uh you know Bix does end up getting restrained by an officer uh right before Tim gets shot um uh we see Karn and Mosk they they learn from you know the the one surviving member of the of the uh, you know the the east team that that Cassian and 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 Raul are, are approaching their direction 
Um, so a, a trooper enters a shop, uh, prompting three aliens to to get out. And uh, Marva notices that the two corporate troopers guarding her are they're 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 a little nervous by by all the beclaying sounds and <laughs> you know they're mm -hmm. like oh man okay we're not ready for this like there there is <laughs> like like it's about to hit the fan right now like uh uh one of the soldiers you know tells marva to shut up uh and uh marva says that when it stops they will they will want to fret so one of the soldiers asks what will happen and um Andor and Ryle encounter the, the 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 fleeing aliens, um, while corporate tactical forces converge around the town center. Andor ambushes a corporate trooper and forces him to surrender his comlink, which he destroys. Andor demands to know how many troops there are, while Ryle urges him to kill the man. The trooper reports that there are twelve men and two officers. Elsewhere, the corporate soldier who shot Tim returns to his mobile tack pod and attempts to fly the ship away. However, the ship has been tied to a large piece of wreckage, which causes the ship to lose control and crash. While Andor and Ryle search for charges, a corporate trooper finds his comrade, whom Andor has gagged and bound. They appear to escape in a blue lance speeder. Corporate soldiers shoot the stolen speeder, causing it to crash. However, they quickly discover it was a decoy with Andor and Ryle <laughs> escaping on a speeder bike. <laughs> Ryle sets the wrecked speeder to explode. Mosk uh, attempts to contact their comrades uh, on the North team, while Karn attends to the wounded and dead comrades. As Andor flees with Ryle on a speeder bike, a tearful Marva experiences a flashback of her and Clem carrying their adoptive son Cassian from the wrecked Separatist starship on Canari. B2 looks up to her with uh, his sensors flashing sadly. Salman and Wilmon free a grieving Bix while Brasso drinks sadly. As Andor and Ryle fly over fields, a shell-shocked Karn is roused by Sergeant Moss, who tells him they need to leave. While the young Cassian meets his adoptive parents in the cockpit in the past, Andor leaves with Ryle on his starship. And that is the end of episode three. Um, so, yeah, what did you guys think of... Uh, the whole gun battle and you know all uh, everything that ensued uh we obviously get uh tim's death and we we get to see another flashback um and we see ryle and cassian uh you know escape uh and see what sort of adventures they get into uh starting next week so yeah what are your thoughts well, you guys are the filmmakers, but mm -hmm. to to my eyes, this was some of the most amazing action I've seen in a while. And and especially the gunfight inside the warehouse with all of those pieces of machinery flying around. And uh, oh, that was incredible. That, that was, was astounding to me. So good. It, it was phenomenal. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. The I have a lot of questions going forward, though. I mean, like, there's there's all this sense of why uh, Rail wants to meet Andor and take Andor with him, but I don't know why. Like, what is it that he sees in Andor? What is it that he's interested in? What makes Andor a special person for him? And and I'm really interested in finding out why that is. I agree. I yeah. I I. I... I, that that was one of the, the main questions that I had as well was as while I was watching it, I was like, what? I mean, other than like, he knows that he's committed a couple of crimes. Maybe is that what he's looking for? I mean, uh, he he doesn't seem like the greatest mentor for him, possibly, <laughs> you know, he seems like he's uh, uh, probably uh, wants to maybe use him if he's a guy who's, you know, OK with just killing people. Um, so I am a little worried about Cassian going forward um uh and what kind of moral decisions he'll be making um but at the same time he had that that uh Rael had that great line where he says he's like always make your exits he's like always put your exits when you get like before you get there or yeah yeah your, and that was a that was a fun line um uh yeah so that was that was I like that a lot 
but I totally agree with you that 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 scene was was so good. Um, there's been so many good moments like that from the the banging on the big metal thing to mm -hmm. then showing everybody else banging on little metal things throughout it throughout the um throughout the city, you know, and the kind of parallel in this in this place where everybody has like a part in what they're doing and everybody kind of um uh is is working together in that way is um I thought that was really interesting and I I I but I'm a sucker for stuff like that where it's like just all these different things going and then everything comes crashing down and it's yeah so good so fun yeah the 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 way that they achieved I mean, there's so many, I mean, there's so many different ways you can go about, you know, shooting a, an action scene. And, and obviously with, when you're working on a Star Wars project and you have, you know, a massive budget, um, it's really up to the, you know, the filmmakers and the talent that you've hired to, you know, we've seen a million, you know, we've seen a million different gunfights and, and a million different ways. And, and we've obviously seen it done numerous ways in, in star Wars, uh, live action and animation. So to see something that's, uh, a scene like that, that's done in such a unique and creative way, um, that, that uses, you know, obviously some of the most cutting edge, uh, filmmaking, uh, it, it's really cool to see. And, um, like a, a show like, like Andor, it's very obvious. You can tell, um, they, they they didn't use like the the volume as much as they did like uh, on a show like Mandalorian or 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 Obi Wan, um, like right like I immediately like f from the trailers I like it, it already I can already tell it looks better than Obi Wan did. Oh yeah, um, and hmm. um, just just from a uh, cinema cinematography aesthetic standpoint, um, but. Uh, you know, and you know, again, I think Obi Wan had like some, the, some of the misfortunes of of you know being a, uh, a, a COVID production. You know, so dealing with some setbacks there, and obviously we we've gone into like some of the stories about the rewrites and and all that that show had to go through, but um, and or already, I mean, at least for me, is is setting itself up to be uh, like. Uh, a su already a superior show i think to obi-wan but like just in general i think it's it's uh it has the potential to to be up there as, with something like like mandalorian um and uh i think that again like you mentioned there are still a lot of questions as to where we, where do we go from here and and uh you know in these first three episodes like there's very little like story so to speak. I mean, we get like, mm -hmm. uh, these set pieces, um, it's more establishing these characters and, and how these characters have, have met. And now that they've met, you know, where are they going? But I think the, to, to establish like the tone and, uh, the sort of, again, the, what the aesthetic of the show is going to be and, uh, what the, the sort of places they're willing to go. I think, I think it really sets itself up for uh, some very unique and interesting uh, Star Wars stories uh, and um, that are obviously not Jedi focused, um, that are not like, uh, that are again dealing with like the the little guy and then, and, and we're not, I mean, when I, we're not, this is not a show about like the legacy characters or we're not going to get again a lot of these cameos or whatever. Um, you know, if we do, if we do get introduced to characters we've seen before, they're going to be most likely characters from, you know, Rogue One or maybe even Solo or, uh, characters from, you know, Star Wars lore that are not like the standouts. Um, but I guess we're also obviously going to be Saw Gerrera supposed to appear? I believe so. I, 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 I don't know if it's, I don't know if that was confirmed, Brandon, you, I don't know if you know this, but. I don't know if it was like officially confirmed that he's going to be on the show, but I, I know it's heavily rumored that he's on the show. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't, but I don't know if it's official, but I would be surprised if he wasn't on the show. I'd love to see it. I mean, I would love to see what 
where that character goes from where we last see him in Rebels to where he is at in Rogue One because mm-hmm. like like visually he looks different than than uh <laughs> than in the show like not just because he's a cartoon and then he's a uh he's not just he's animated and then he's real but like like he, physically he looks different um mm-hmm. and he's like personality wise he's he's on a way I mean he was always kind of a, a little more radical but he's on like a much different um uh end when we see him in Rogue One so I as a character I would love to to see return in the show um to get a little more of uh of how he gets to where he is so yeah yeah well and then as you said the kind of conspicuous by its absence is the force Mm-hmm. I don't think it's mentioned even once. Um, I haven't. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, was it? Oh, I was going to say, I haven't heard it at all. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is to, to my mind, the force is one of the things that makes star Wars unique among sci-fi properties out there. And, and uh, so I'm curious whether and how like in rogue one, you kind of saw the, the religious side of the force. Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. more than the jedi side or the 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 powerful side of the force but yeah i'm wondering what we'll see going forward yeah that i that's i i really like that that take in um in rogue one as well with uh Mm -hmm. donnie yen's character right who's uh yeah he says that i'm the uh what does he say i'm one with the force and the force is with me right is that his line that he keeps saying yeah 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 it's it's a very um yeah i want it's a good question right now we're not seeing people that believe in much so (laughs) right yeah Yeah. it's a very secular star wars yeah in that sense (laughs) yeah (laughs) absolutely yeah um yeah and and, uh, yeah it's an interesting it's again it's a it's an interesting uh perspective to see because like even like like someone like that character who 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 is like just believes fully in in the force and uh that it will be their saving grace in the end you know we're we're seeing people that like have never even you know encountered you know a jedi or you know maybe have heard like mythological stories or or what might be myths to them but this is not Mm -hmm. something that it's not something that's on the daily mind of uh of like a cassian um uh, you know, uh, or, or, or just anyone who's trying to, the, again, the, the, the little guy who's just trying to make it and, and, and pose a fight against the empire, uh, you know, they're just trying to do what they can within their means, um, to, to make a difference. So again, I think that's what makes this show potentially very, uh, very special. Um, and, something that can stand out uh in its own way um but yeah that's to be determined you know uh, we'll, we'll we'll see uh next week we'll have episode four and uh we'll definitely be here to cover it um any uh any final thoughts uh before we uh start to wrap up i know we went on longer than usual but you know it's it, three episodes we had to cover so uh <laughs> i think i think we did it's a um, lot of ground. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh again, I you know, it'll be uh we'll get we'll it'll be easier with the one one episode a week uh, going forward, but uh, any final thoughts before uh we wrap this thing up? I'm just really interested in the moral questions they're raising, you know, mm-hmm. what's what's good, what's bad, what's heroic, what's uh what's villainous. Mm-hmm. They're they're painting a very complex moral universe here. Yeah, I, I I agree on that. I I think that's uh, yeah, we're seeing we're seeing a lot. Yeah, they're building up a lot to to be redeemed. So I think that uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the show so far as as far as uh morality, um, is concerned. So I I agree. I'm I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, I hope. And again, I hope I hope they don't like. There, there. Like I mentioned, there. I thought there was a good balance in these three episodes mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, teasing the, the the heroism that's to come. You know, the, the sort of heroic traits, mm-hmm. uh, but also 
showing like how dire it is and and like where you know the, the sort of like literal hell he had to, he, he's like trying to you know going through that he's going through uh to uh to fight this fight um so i i again because we know the ending i hope that uh we get to see more different we get to see different perspectives see some like introduce a, to cool characters and maybe revisit like other characters obviously like saw Guerrero, maybe so, someone like like Enfist Ness from from Solo, mm -hmm. I think would would fit in as well, and 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 Saw could be like the the sort of bridge between, you know, the, those two characters, um, uh, Enfist Ness and the the Cloud Riders, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think they would, you know, they would fit into the show, and it would be cool to see, you know, more of what they're about. Um, so yeah, I'm ex uh, I'm excited. I think, uh, uh, we're I think it's it's established off pretty quickly. Um, I get, I mean, it's been pretty critically acclaimed so far. I think most very positive reviews across the board for the show, and I think it's it's uh, it's well deserved. So, um, looking forward to uh, to watching it uh, again next week. Um, uh, and. Before we really end this episode, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons uh, who make it possible for us to create Secrets of Star Wars, including Jody H., Julie M., Tony S., uh, SB Writing, and Barbara G. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the Secrets of Star Wars and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give and be sure to sus subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or on the SQPN YouTube channel. To find previous episodes of Secret of Star Wars and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash Star Wars. You can email us at starwars at sqpn.com or follow StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash starquestmedia or on Twitter at sqpn. Or you can join our Discord community at sqpn.com slash Discord. We'll be back next week with another uh, episode covering uh, episode four of uh, Andor. Um, so until then, uh, Robert King, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Wars. Thanks for having me. And Brandon Manderson, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. Very excited about this. Of course. And once again, I'm Andrew Hermes. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. Here's another show on the StarQuest network you're sure to enjoy. The Secrets of Middle Earth. Find it wherever you can find podcasts or at sqpn.com slash Middle Earth.